religious minds diminish the glory of the Lord we have reduced glory down to a feeling therefore we are driven by emotion but real glory is not feeling real glory is function when the glory of the Lord really comes into a room his glory is him putting his full self on display. In other words, real glory is all of him being all that he can be and wants to be in your life. So when the glory of the Lord comes into a room, it doesn't respect how you feel. I said when the glory of the Lord comes into a room, the glory doesn't respect your feelings. God comes in a room to visit a people and he is on a mission to turn his face towards us until all we want is all that he is. Lord, get us back to the glory. You do know that the church was never called to go from outpouring to drought to outpouring to drought to outpouring to drought. The call of kingdom living and revival is to finally go from glory to glory to glory to glory to glory to glory to glory. God never called this thing to end. He called you to go to another level, to another level, to an the glory of the Lord. I feel him here today. He wants to be more than a weekend visit for you. He wants to be more than two and a half hours. He wants to become real today. I am pregnant with this word. And I told the Lord today that if you didn't want me to preach, don't have me preach and I'm okay with it. Hide me is what I told the Lord. But God has seen fit for the service to arrive to this point, And I have something from the Lord for you. <laughs> Acts chapter 12. Get your Bibles out. We're coming back tonight at 6 to get in this river all over again. Thank God for our apostle. Thank God for Pastor Dawn. That'd be a great chance for you to appreciate the Lord for allowing them to be a leader in your life. I'm going to say this and then I'm going to read the text, Acts chapter 12. Revival doesn't happen by accident. Moves of God are intentional. So it takes a man of God and a woman of God somewhere to say yes despite the inconvenience come on y'all despite the calendar nothing about this revival made sense Super Bowl Sunday and Valentine's Day and Daytona 500 it doesn't make sense in the natural but we don't live in the natural we live in the spirit and I honor our apostle and pastor Dawn for having the fortitude come on y'all 
the guts to say yes when it didn't make sense in the natural. Come on, if you honor this man and woman of God, normally they're not even here, but since she's here. Come on, this ain't pulling from the atmosphere. God loves honor. Acts chapter 12. If you didn't read your Bible all week, you're going to read it today. 11 verses. And God's going to speak. Are you ready to hear what the Spirit's saying? This is what the word of the Lord says. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched out his hand to harass some from the church. Then he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to seize Peter also. Now it was during the days of unleavened bread. So when he had arrested him, Peter, he put him, Peter, in the prison and delivered him, Peter, to four squads of soldiers to keep him, intending to bring him before the people after Passover. Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. And when Herod was about to bring him out that night, Peter was sleeping bound with two chains between two soldiers and the guards were before the door were keeping the prison now behold an angel of the Lord stood by him and light shined in the prison and he struck Peter on the side and raised him up saying arise quickly and his chains fell off his hands <laughs> then the angel said to him gird yourself up tie on your sandals and so he did and he said to him, put on your garment and follow me. So he went out and followed him and did not know that what was done by the angel was real. But he thought he was seeing a vision. When they were past the first and second guard posts, they came to the iron gate that leads to the city, which opened to them on its own accord. And they went out, went down one street, and immediately the angel departed from him. Last verse. And when Peter had come to himself, he said, now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel and has delivered me from the hand of Herod and from all of the expectation of the Jewish people. I want to preach very quickly on the subject. Give me revival and give us an awakening. If that's your prayer, slip up your hands. Father, I know you're about to speak. I have felt you in my soul. You are yearning today to talk to your people. So let our ears be open to hear what the Spirit is saying. Shut out every distraction. Devil, we bind you now. You have no authority in here. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. You can be seated. And as you're seated, just look at somebody and say, give me revival. And then look at them again and say, and give us awakening. Give me revival. Give us awakening. If there's anything I believe you have to understand this morning about the text that I bring before you, is that the text I bring before you is located in the book of Acts. The book of Acts is a profound book written by Dr. Luke. The book of Acts is the book saying that there are acts of, watch this, of the disciples or the apostles post-Pentecost. A better title or a better translation should read Acts of the Holy Spirit through the apostle. Because all that we do that makes a difference only happens when we are being led and empowered by the Spirit. Nothing that you do will have the impact it's supposed to have lest you do it with the Spirit of God leading you to do it. And that's what these men had. They had the Spirit of God pushing them out into the world to make a difference. But by the time we get to Acts chapter 12, it seems like because it's a long time reading that it's been a long time for these men. But the truth about this text could be further from the truth. The truth about Acts 12 is simply this, is that these men are sitting in the infancy of the church. That back then it was so new and so fresh that they didn't even call it the church. They called it the way. And they weren't even called Christians, the Bible said, until Antioch. 
That means the text that I bring before you is in the days of the church's infancy. But let me just say this at the onset of this message, that though the church is in its infancy, it does not lack potency. That though it is in a new beginning and a brand new start, and though it is in the embryonic stages of becoming the church that we see today, the global church, please know that while they were young, they weren't powerless. Because God has a way of getting in things when they are in embryonic form so that they stay pure and move into power. That is for every person in the room who is young in God, little in gifting, small in stature, and you are sitting in the room saying, I'm in revival, but I don't have much. God is here to tell you that you don't have to have much to have revival. That you don't have to have a lot to have a move of God. In fact, God thrives when people take their little and put it their little in the hands of his big, come on, big nature and big self. They thrive when all of a sudden people say, it's not much, but God, what I have belongs to you. See, you don't even understand. Hell is not nervous about you using your gift. Hell is nervous about you putting your gift in God's hands so that God can work through you for the world around you. The church was in its embryonic stages, but they failed to understand the power of God getting in the little things. I know our theology would preach him big, and let's make no mistake, he is big. But though he is big, he's not afraid to get in small. You do know that it's an acorn before it's an oak tree. It's five loaves and two fish before it feeds a multitude. It's faith the size of a grain of a mustard seed before it, come on y'all, before it moves a mountain. It's one son for many sons. It's 12 men for a church. And it's 120 on the day of Pentecost before it becomes a global awakening. Don't you, oh come on somebody, don't you dare despise the day of small beginnings. Uh, it may start small, but here's the word of the Lord. Though it starts small, it will not stay small as long as God gets in what you give. And the church was in its infancy. It did not lack potency. And though it was small in structure, God still gave it, it, gave it a great mission. And he called the little church, watch this, to change the world. The call on your life is to change the world. And the reason why only five of you said amen is because the enemy has convinced you that what you have doesn't have that capacity. The enemy is already trying to convince the church that this revival won't last, that it's not going to make it another couple of months. But I came to tell you that the devil is a liar. God is about, come on y'all, God is about to do something that lasts beyond what you see because you may look at it like something small, but God sees it for what it really is. You are called to change the world. Don't you ever let the enemy convince you. If God gave it to you, it has the capacity. I don't know who I'm talking to, but I feel like preaching now. Whatever God gave you has the capacity to make a difference. Whatever God gave to you has the ability to do something big. Whatever little gift you have, whether it's singing, whether it's business, whatever God put in your hands has the ability to push every devil up out of the region and in the city and in your family. If God gave it to you, it's bigger than what you think. Just put your hand on your chest and say it's bigger than what I know. It's bigger than what you know. It's bigger than what you know. I'm going to say it to you. Believe it. It's bigger than what you know. Your preaching gift, your anointing, his favor, your glory, everything he put on you, it's bigger than what you know. So you have to stay faithful in the small until God makes it big. And God took his church and he said, your call is to change the world. Notice I did not say be like the world. Somewhere over the last few decades, the church thought it right to join the culture. I'm going to preach it whether you like it or not. We thought it would be right to be like 
the world. But the Bible is very clear that we are not called to be like the world. We are supposed to be a counterculture to the world. Therefore, there ought to be some lines drawn in the sand that says the world does that, but we don't. Uh, they go there, but I don't. They say that, but I don't. And it doesn't make me better than you. It just shows that my allegiance is to one greater than myself. And my life is not my own. I am living according let me show you what I mean. I can remember back in the day, my grandparents would go into a room, and because they were so full of the Holy Ghost, when they went into the room, the room changed. They changed the room. The room didn't change them. Somewhere this fear and intimidation and compromise has snuck in the body and it has poisoned us from within to the point where we feel we can't say anything and can't do anything. The devil is a liar. It's time for you to understand that if God be for you, before you what can be against you and no weapon formed against you shall be able to prosper give me some believers that know how to stand up in a room and say what I got is greater than what's on you oh, and God is about to do something I remember there was a day when a believer would walk in a room people would stop cussing I remember they'd be talking about how crazy the party was, how what they did, how awful it was, how wild it was, and then a believer would sneak up in there, and all of a sudden, every other spirit would get real quiet. And before you know it, if you did it right, by the end of the conversation, they'd be asking you for prayer. See, where are those believers who say, I didn't come, I didn't come for myself. I came to make a difference. I came to make an impact. I don't want to be like you. I want to show you what you can have if you find the same Jesus I found. Ooh. This is not the hour to fit in. Hear me by the Spirit. This is not the hour to be liked. The goal was never to be popular. The goal was to be powerful and carry weight from another world. The church knew it was different. They didn't try to be like them. They knew who they were and they stood and held the line and said, it stops here. But they didn't do it by themselves because in order to make that kind of difference and that kind of impact. And by the way, let me just say this. We have been lied to. We have told you that the height of leadership is influence. See how quiet it is? Because we told you through like Instagram and TikTok and Facebook that the goal was to get followers. We, we told you that the height is influence. But here's what I know. The, the height is not influence. It's impact in the kingdom. God, God didn't call you to influence it. He calls you to influence it so you can impact it. Do you not know in this room, this ain't even in my notes, you get one life. You get one life to live. And far be it that you go through this life and you never hit anything and make a dent in it. Far be it, you live your, all, your, all your years and you live in such a way where you were waiting on God to do something, not knowing that God has already empowered you to hit something. In 2023, you know what your calling is? It's to hit something. Your calling is to impact something. Your calling is to did something. Why? So that by the time you're done, they can look back and say, look uh, at the impact. Your influence fades. Your impact is forever. But they were not foolish enough to think that they could do what they were called to do in the early church by themselves. They understood that in order to do this kind of mission, have this kind of power, move in this kind of authority, that they would have to have the power of the Holy Spirit of God. That's why he pulled them into an upper room to tell them that I'm not going to release you out there until I fill you up in here. That's why every person in the room needs a Pentecostal experience. You need a moment by which the Spirit of God flows into your life and fills you up and empowers you. Because some of the devils you're about to fight, you couldn't win if it was just you. 
Some of the stuff you're losing against right now is because you're fighting that devil in your power and in your strength. But some of you need to understand that this thing ain't by might and it ain't by power. But if you're going to win, you're going to have to win because you have the anointing and the spirit of God. A true church that's in revival is marked by those who love the power of God. Is there anybody in the room who says, Pastor Josh, I just want more power. God, whatever power I need, whatever anointing I need, I don't say no. I push away my pride. And Father, I say, give me the power of the Holy Ghost. They were not empowered by some separate spirit or some lesser Holy Ghost, but the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. Paul said, didn't just fill them up, the same spirit now fills you up to overflow. Do you not understand what I just told you? I didn't tell you that there was some lesser Holy Ghost or some deluded Holy Ghost or some perverted Holy Ghost, but the same spirit that rolled away to stone and got Jesus out of the grave is the one working on the inside of you. You've got some power, and if you know it, you ought to give God some praise. I'm talking about the kind of power that lays their hands on sick people knowing they're going to recover. I'm talking about the kind of power that when you lay your hands, demons run. Uh, sickness leaves. Uh, bodies are healed. Minds are renewed. That kind of Holy Ghost power. Do you want it? Make some noise. The mark of the early church was that they knew in order to fulfill the mission They had to have his power. Had to have his power. And that Acts 2 dunamis explosion. Think about it. That Acts 2 dunamis explosion, when it hit that 120, it didn't stay there. It was so profound and so full that it began to spill into every facet of life, government, oh, y'all quiet, and religion. It started to spill out into every facet of life, government, and religion to the point contextually where the government, Rome, started saying, what's going on down there? Because, and then they realized that it had such power that they said, if we don't stop this, It's going to take over. With your prophetic ears, I want you to hear what I'm about to say. Hell is convening. Principalities are convening. And they are saying, if we don't stop this, if we don't stop this move of God that's happening in America, it's about to take over. It's about to take over. It's about to take over. I said, it's about to take over. It's about to take over. We're about to take over college campuses. We're about to take over your household. We're about to take over your bit. We're about to take over. When you get full of the Spirit, you will overflow. Don't tell me You are full of the Spirit and not drip somewhere. Don't tell me you're full of the Holy Ghost and you don't praise God. You don't talk about the Lord. You don't pray. When you get full of the Holy Ghost, you ain't going to be able to move without dripping on somebody. Somebody sent me a, a TikTok the other day. I don't have TikTok. I know what it is, but I ain't got a TikTok. So somebody sent me a TikTok. I thought that was for clocks. Come on, y'all. They sent me a TikTok, and it was a challenge. And they called it the water challenge. And they had this cup. And this glass, this glass looked like it was full. Because you can look like you're full. And not really be full. And so what the challenge was is see how much water you can pour in before it overflows. And I was shocked 
that how much more could be poured? Can I go deeper? Because the only way we know you're full is when you overflow. And there came a moment when one drop of water, a single drop, sent a full cup from full to overflow. And the Lord told me to tell somebody in this room that some of you have been seeking him so diligently and you've been coming after him so wholeheartedly that you are a drop away. A praise away. A hallelujah away. A glory to God away. A yes Lord away. Some obedience away. And you are about to go into overflow. And when you do blessing and favor and anointing, it's about to overtake your life. I don't know who I'm talking to, but if you're ready to go into overflow, why don't you take 10 seconds and just begin to open up your mouth and say, Lord, fill me up till I overflow. By the time this thing is done, you're going to drip on your children. You're going to drip on your job. You're going to drip. I know drip is a youth word, uh, but let's take it back for the right thing. We're about to get drippy for Jesus. Uh, We're about to be drippy for the kingdom. Everybody's about to know what we got. Woo! That's what they're waiting on. They're waiting for you to overflow. They're tired of you talking about it. Y'all ain't saying nothing. They're tired of you posting about it. They're waiting to experience it. And for all of them that can't get it here right now, that means they're waiting on you to get out there and drip a little bit of this revival on them. Then all of a sudden it whets their appetite. Say, show me where the more is. What happened to the early church as they got so empowered and so full that it began to leak? into the marketplace, into government, and to religion. And all of a sudden they said, if we don't stop this, it's going to take over. And so they came up with a plan. Bring James to me. And the Bible says they killed James. And when they saw that it pleased the Jews, when it pleased religion to shut it down, Because religion hates revival. It will act like it likes it until it inconveniences tradition long enough to agitate it. And then you'll see what religion really likes. Religion loves mediocrity. Religion loves status quo. Y'all ain't saying nothing. That's what religious love. And the religious spirit likes it as well. That's why I feel like there's a room of radical people in this room today who say you know what be done with religion I'm done with status quo Christianity I'm done with this and that I'm done with predictability God take me into a space that's so crazy and so wild and so adventurous that God I can't wait to get to the next thing you do Lord rid us of religion and they killed James and then they saw that it pleased them. So now it's not James. They said, give us Peter. That's a bold move. Because Peter is not just one of the disciples. He's the rock. Jesus said, he's going to be the one I build my church on. Now the enemy's getting bold. He's not just going after the disciples. He's going after the one person that if he gets him, he shuts the whole thing down. Which led me to this thought that when real revival comes, attack comes, but the first place you find the attack is not at your doorstep. When the attack really comes, it ain't coming to you. It's coming to the doorstep of leadership. Help me do it, Lord. Help me do it. Help me do it. See, you don't even know what it takes 
for us to stand up here and lead this thing and preach this thing. You don't know the fight that Apostle and Pastor Dawn have to get through just to ensure. See, some of you don't even know that when the bullets start flying, oftentimes it's leadership that gets hit first. And I'm going to say something, but I, I want you to hear my heart. But please know, we don't mind taking the bullet as long as we know you got our back. I don't mind the arrow. I don't mind the fight. I don't mind the enemy hitting me like that. As long as I know you're in my back saying, don't stop. Don't stop. I'm praying for you, Pastor. I'm praying for you, Apostle. I'm lifting the church up. We don't mind taking the bullet as long as we know that if we fall, you're going to push us there until we get it right. This is Bible. The righteous man may fall seven times, but he keeps getting up again because revival is worth it. What I'm trying to tell you is that before you write your silly email in the middle of a move of God, before you get crazy, before you complain about us, please pray for us. Because he wasn't going after those, little, those, those new disciples. He said, I want to take the whole operation down. And the Bible says he got Peter. And the Bible says he arrested Peter. And then the text is clear that he put four squads of soldiers around Peter. Four squads, 16 soldiers for one man. Can I help you? They all told me not to tell you this, but I'm going to tell you anyway. You want to know what you carry? Look at what the enemy assigns. You want to know what you really got? You want to know what's really on your life? Look at all this stuff that the enemy's throwing your way. You want, see, see, the enemy wants you to get your eyes on how much and how many and how crazy but God is trying to wake you up to the reality that he wouldn't if you didn't have all that power and all that anointing and all that glory there wouldn't be this kind of assignment why because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world I came to tell you wake up church you are more and you are mightier and you are more powerful than you know don't get caught up in the assignment take your eyes off the assignment and look inside and see the glory for these light affliction these light affliction they look tough but they light these light afflictions, the Bible said, are working. An exceeding weight of glory in your life. You realize that every time God lets the devil hit you, he lets him hit you because of how strong it'll make you. That's for the person in the room that you get over one thing and get hit with another. Get over one thing, get hit with another. And you're going, God, why do I keep getting hit? God said, you just wait because you see yourself as getting hit. But I'm trying to show you how strong that you really are. Because one day I'm going to push back these devils and we're about to see the glory of God revealed in your life. Why don't you make the devil mad for about 10 seconds and just say, devil, I'm still here. I'm still here. You tried to hit me. You tried to get me away from church. You tried to get me to stop serving. You tried to wreck my marriage. You tried to wreck my children. But devil, bad news. I'm still here. Some of you were about to quit. You can't quit. You can't give up. You can't give in. You can't let go. Why? Because it's just about time to for God to show forth his power in your life. And 16 soldiers for one fisherman. He ain't even a warrior. He's a fisherman. But he's got power. And then it hit me, Natasha. 16. Now that's not a number that you hear about much in the Bible. Because we love numbers. Yeah, y'all do. 
We like one. We like two agreement. Three trinitary trinitary completion. We like five because it's grace. We like seven because it's completion. We like eight because it's new beginnings. We like 10 because it's order and 12 because it's governmental order. But I haven't heard a sermon about 16. So the studier that I am said, talk to me about 16. And this is what I found out about 16. 16 is the number traced to the idea of having loved or in the process of loving. Let me show you what I mean. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's John 3. Then I stepped over into 1 John, the love book, and you get to the 16th reference of love. And when you get to the 16th reference of love in the book of 1 John, it's this verse. Perfect love casts out all fear. Then I went over to 1 Corinthians because in 1 Corinthians, Paul has a whole chapter about love. He says, love is, love is kind, love, love is, love is, love. Do you know how many times Paul said love is? He said love is 16 times. And then it hit me that maybe at this point, the enemy's not trying to shut down Peter's power. He is trying to quiet Peter's love. Because for all the power that comes with revival, it's only revealed and related to the world when power walks in love. Now it makes sense why the enemy spent three years trying to divide people outside the church and inside the church. What was he trying to do? He couldn't stop our power, so he tried to pollute and pervert our love for one another. That's why Jesus said, yeah, they ain't going to know you're my disciples by how much power you have. He said, they'll know you're mine by how much love you have one for another. But I came to tell the devil on a Sunday morning in revival that this church is not just a church of signed wonders, miracles, and power, that this church is rising in the love of God, and the world is about to know no, no greater love than this that Jesus laid down his life we are about to see a love revolution I don't care how much power you got if you can't love the waitress at lunch I don't care how much you fall out if you cuss your kids out that ain't revival don't tell me you can lay hands on the sick and treat people terribly the devil is a liar God get people back to the understanding that we are called to be a love generation Can I go deeper? Because while we're talking about revival and moves of the Holy Spirit, there is a move of the Spirit that nobody talks about in Scripture. We love Acts 2. We love the day of Pentecost being fully come. We love 1 Corinthians because we get to see all the power gifts. But Romans 5.5 5 says that there is a move of the Spirit that does this, that sheds abroad the love of God by the Holy Spirit. One of the greatest moves of the Spirit in your life wasn't you speaking in tongues. One of the greatest moves of the Spirit wasn't you falling down and getting happy. The greatest move of the Spirit in your life is the day you came down to an altar and realized that you had found false love in every other place. But all of a sudden, the agape love of the Father met you at an altar. And when you encountered real love, the Father love, divine love, that love changed your life. Am I in the right room this morning? Is there anybody in the room that can testify and say, I have encountered the real love of God and I will never never be the same we need more believers who will testify of the love of God and maybe the enemy wasn't shutting down Peter's power he was trying to chain Peter's love Whew. I said he was trying to chain Peter's love because love goes further than power Love can reach further than gifting. Lord, take the shackles off of your people and let love flow like a river to this city. And so Peter has 16 soldiers. I got to hurry. 
He's chained between two. And the Bible says that things don't look good for Peter. But before you go crazy and say, this ain't good, this ain't looking right, the Bible is very clear that the only reason Peter is surviving, what he's surviving, is because behind the scenes, prayer is being offered to God by the church. So now we see the marks of a post-Pentecostal church that's in revival. They are pursuing power, walking in love, and they are committed to prayer. You have to be willing to pray in this season. I know that's too simple for some of you, but you have to be committed to prayer because I know I'm about to bust your theology right here, but the enemy is not scared of your praise. We have taught your generation that you can praise your way, praise your way, dance your way, shout your way, and then we see you at the altar next week for the same thing you were praising about. The enemy is not afraid of your praise. Why? Why? Let me, let me teach you. Why is he not afraid of your praise? So I can help your theology. He's not afraid of your praise because it's not to him. He's got pride issues, y'all. And he don't care about your praise because you aren't magnifying him. But what he is afraid of is when you praise God and then start turning that praise into a prayer life. Because the reason why he's so scared of prayer is because when you start praying, God, start gets, God starts to get involved. When you start praying, God starts coming and God starts moving and God starts shifting some things. The enemy is not scared for you to shout and sing your song, but he's scared to death of a people who get on their knees and begin to pray and say, God, God, invade the situation. The devil's the death. He's so deathly afraid of the when the, when the celestial invades the terrestrial. And God's people begin to pray. Smith Wigglesworth said this. He's a giant in the faith. Smith was so anointed. Anybody know Smith Wigglesworth? Wave at me. Smith was so anointed, he'd walk by breaker boxes and they would fritz. Now that's anointed. If you can change electricity, you got something. Smith said this about prayer. He said, I never pray for more than 30 minutes at a time. But... I never go more than 30 minutes without praying. See, the church has to get out of these lay me down to sleep prayers. We got to get out of these weak and anemic, played out prayers. And we need to get down on our face, whether we look ugly, look crazy, whether we get loud, whether we look weird, and we say, devil, back up off my children. Devil, back up off my family. Devil, back up off my nation. The kind of prayers that'll have you sitting at a red light, squalling and crying. The ones that'll have you screaming out uh, in the living room of your house saying, God, save my children. God, touch my body. God, wake up the church to prayer. Let me finish this thing. If I leave it here, it almost looks like revival's not worth it. Why, Pastor Josh? Because the church has power, they have love, and they have prayer, and Peter's still bound. This text takes a turn for me, Natasha, because the Bible says that even though the church is in revival, the next time we see Peter, don't miss this, the next time we see Peter, the apostle Peter, the Bible says that Peter is not praising, he's not praying. The Bible says that the next time we see Peter, He has fallen asleep. When I saw that Peter fell asleep, I was shocked. Not Peter. Not Peter. Peter's one of the most proactive disciples of the bunch. Nobody else is walking on water. Peter is. Peter's the one slicing off ears. He's proactive. He's active. But the Bible says in the midst of the craziness... Peter has fallen asleep. But it's deeper because I know what some of you are saying. Give the guy a break. He's taking a nap. <laughs> Until you look at the Greek. And the Greek word for slumber means to sleep 
as if deceased. That means when they checked in on Peter and the craziness, Peter was so sleepy it looked like he was dead. And the Lord told me to tell you, never let the world look at you and talk about the times you used to be alive. Never let your neighbors look at you and talk about the times you used to be awake. Never let this city ever look at Calvary and say, I remember days when... Some of you have been rocked to sleep by the enemy and you don't even know it. The news, trouble, politics, circumstances, issues have slowly rocked some of us to sleep. I looked at why Theologians thought Peter was sleeping like this. The answer, it almost is, it's almost unbelievable. They said that, the, the theologians said that the reason that Peter was sleeping like this is because secretly he thought it was over. Help me do it, Lord. And some of us won't admit it under our church shout and our church clothes. But we've seen some stuff over the last couple years. And while we sing the songs and we hear the preacher, there's something in us that wonders, is it over? A doctor's report comes. I feel the anointing, y'all. Doctor's reports come. And you've been claiming healing. And you get the report and the enemy whispers, is it over? We are standing two weeks ago and we see the Grammys and the enemy parades himself in front of the world and some of us would be lying if we didn't see it and go, is it over? And anytime you believe that it's over, it won't be long. Before you sleep, could this revival be a response from somebody who said, God, I don't care if they think it's over or they think it's over. I still believe. I still believe that you're not finished. I still believe that people are going to get I still believe you can take a city in a day. I still believe. Is there anybody in the room that says, I still believe? As I still believe, I still believe, I still believe. I still believe in signs, wonders, and miracles. I still believe in household salvation. I still believe my marriage can come back together. I still believe, I still believe you're not done. Because nobody gets to say that it's over except God. I feel that in my spirit. I said nobody gets to say it's done except God. And I don't care what lie the, I feel like preaching. I don't care what lie the enemy has whispered to you, what he's told you, what he said you'll never have, what he said you'll never have again. The devil is a liar. God told me to tell you it's not over. It's not over in America. It's not over in Generation Z. It's not over. It's not over in Hollywood. It's not over. It's not over in Ormond Beach. It's not over. But we have been lulled to sleep because sometimes we think, is it over? And God said, I'm done. Peter, I'm going to have enough grace and mercy that even though I hear your whisper. I am about to visit you. And so God sent an angel. 
Y'all get happy. Because in our world, we've been talking about demons way too much. We've been talking about the demonic way too much. We've been giving too much glory to the things of darkness. And it's all been a ploy to get you to stop and not see that the fact that God has begun to deploy angels. Angels. Well, what's the word of the Lord, Pastor Josh? The Lord told me to tell you, here come the angels. Here come the angels. Here come the angels. Here comes the host of heaven. Here comes the glory of God. Here comes the force of God himself. Here come the angels. Angels to do what you cannot do. Angels to be what you cannot be. Here come. I said, here come. The cherubim and seraphim are coming. They're coming. They're coming. They're coming to your body. They're coming to your Here they come. The, the angels are coming. And the angel came. And when the angel showed up, I'm landing this plane. He stepped right past all 16 guards. Because ain't nothing can stop what God starts. I don't care what the devil told you about this revival about your life. God is about to send an angel that's going to bypass addiction. He's going to bypass family. stuff. He's going to bypass. And the angel stood right next to Peter. And the Bible says when the angel came, light came. God's about to shine the light in America all over again. When the angels come, the light comes. And let me just say this. We've got to give people grace to adjust to the light. The other night I was laying down, and Jocelyn came in the room. The room was dark, and I was about asleep. And she hit that light, and I made the ugliest face you have ever seen. The reason you're laughing is because you know you do it too. When that light pops on, you don't look cute. When the light comes on, when it's real dark, this is your face. Why? Because light is hard to receive when it first comes. And we got to give people grace that when they come in there and they don't know our church rhythms and they don't know the way we do stuff, you got to give them grace and let them adjust to the light so that they can walk in the light as he is in the light. They saw and so, the angel, the light, and I expected him to walk up with a holy salutation to Peter. Get up. Get up. Psst, it's me from heaven. Get up. But the Bible says the angel does something crazy. The Bible says he walks up and he don't pat Peter. He hit Peter. You turn the light on, I'll give you grace. You hit me? I'm saved, but I'm saved. And of all people to hit, Peter? Risky move. Why does the angel choose to hit him? And it makes no sense until you look at the Greek. The Greek word for hit there or smite there is the Greek word patasso. And it doesn't mean to hit or punch. Patasso means to, to knock. What was the angel telling Peter? Peter, wake up. Wake up. Revival's here. Wake up. Wake up. You've gone to sleep too long. You've been asleep too much. You believe too many lies. Wake up, 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 wake up. And the Lord told me to tell the church if you listen closely, you can hear it. Heaven is knocking on the door of God's people telling you, wake up, 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 get up, get up, get up. Revival, 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 now, 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 now. Wake up, church. 
Wake up, church. It's not the time to hide, church. It's not the time to fall asleep, man of God. Wake up! Wake up, Peter. Revival is not coming. It's standing beside you. Then I remember, Pastor Don, the Bible says this. Behold, I stand at the door and I potasso. And if any man, any woman opens, I will. Not I might. Not I'm trying to think about it. Not I'm going to trick you and leave. If any man opens, I will come in. How do you get revival in your life? You open up the door when you hear the knocking. All across this room, lift up your hands as a sign. If you got to stand on your feet, stand here, the glory of the Lord has started to come in this room. But I, I, I dare you to take about 30 seconds. And all across this room, open up. Open up, open up, open up. Open up, open up. Open up your mouth. Open up your heart. Come on, begin to cry out, God, I hear the knocking. We hear the knocking. We hear it, Lord. Come on, don't stop. Don't stop. Don't stop. Open up your mouth. There's a river of God's presence about to come in this room. There's a river of glory about to come in this room. I came to tell you, it's not over. It's not finished. The knocking has begun. And God is looking for men and women who will wake up and respond. Yeah. Can you hear the knock? Can you hear the knock? Can you hear the knock? Can you hear the knocking, Mama? Can you hear the knocking, Daddy? Can you hear it? It's time for revival. It's time for a move of God. It's time for a move of the Spirit. Can you hear it? Some of you, it's been years since you had an encounter with God. And God sent me to tell you, He is knocking all over again. If you're in this room and you say, Pastor Josh, I hear the knocking. I hear the knocking of the Spirit. And I want revival in my life. I want a move of God in my life. I want you to meet me at this altar. Hurry, hurry, hurry. Hurry, hurry. And come with your hands lifted. Come on there. He's knocking. He's knocking. He's knocking. He's knocking. He's knocking. He's knocking now. Now it's not coming. We don't know how long the window will be open. But right now there is a knock. There is a knock at the door of your heart. There's a knock at the door of your life. He's saying. Now all across this front begin to open up your mouth. Come on, let it cry. Let a cry of revival. Let a wake up call of revival come up out of your heart. Come on, men and women of God. If you're ready, if you're ready, open up your mouth. Come on, from the balcony to the front. From side to side, open up your mouth. The angels, they're knocking. They're saying, now's the time. Now's the moment. I'm going to give you just a couple more seconds if you want revival for you and your family. Come on, get in these aisles if you have to. Get in these aisles if you have to. Whatever you got to do, whatever you got to do. Come on, we're going to finish up here in a second. But this is the moment. The knocking has begun. There is a prophetic knocking at the hearts of men. Some will answer and some will not. But God is knocking. He's knocking. He's knocking. Where can I send it? Who can I do it through? Which man? Which woman? He is saying, now open up. Open up. I'll make you the man. I'll make you the woman. You have to open up. The hardest part about this as a pastor is I can't make you open your door. 
some will open, some will not. But I've made up my mind, Pastor John, that if I can hear the knocking, I won't let this moment pass me by. This is it. And so, look up here, Pastor Josh, because I'm about to lead you into something. And so, Peter woke up. That's the first thing. And then the Bible says, he stood up. When he stood up, his chains fell off. The Lord told me that some of you had some stubborn chains that told you that they will never come in off and you could go after God but God said into this atmosphere of revival even as I speak uh, chains of addiction are falling off uh, chains are falling off as you lift your hands uh, chains are falling come on why don't you rejoice uh, and let the Holy Ghost uh, undo your chains on a Sunday morning chains of poverty chains of abuse chains of witchcraft they're falling off now they're falling off now they're falling off now why so you can praise god like you wanted to so you give god glory how you've been wanting to your chains are falling all right then peter woke up and then he stood up and the angel said hold on before we go to revival I've noticed something about you. During your slumber, you took some stuff off that you used to have on. So put your sandals on and put your clothes on. Here's a prophetic word. God said, put it all back on. Everything you thought you lost, every dream that God gave you that you said, well, God said, put it back on. Put on your ministry calling again. Put on your anointing again. Put on your dream again. Put it all back on again. You're going to need it for where I'm taking you. Put it back on. Peter put it on. And the angel said, let's go to revival. And they walked out of the cell. Nobody touched them. They got to the first guard post and the second. And nobody stopped them. Prophetic word. Receive this. Prophetic word. Where you used to have to stop, you ain't going to have to stop again. God in revival is about to remove the limitations off of your mind and your dreams and where you got caught up and held up before and hindered before God said you will not be hindered in this season of revival I will bless my people as they go after my own heart he walked past you know what Peter said Pastor, he said is this real prophetic word God in this revival is about to do stuff that's too good to be true. I don't know who that's for, but the Lord said some of you got some really hard things that seem impossible and seem like they'll never happen. God said, watch me. It's going to be too good to be true. You're going to stand on the other side of miracles in this move of God and say, God, I never thought it could happen. I never thought it would be. And God is about to blow your mind. Here it is. And he said, let's go to revival. And I thought he would lead him to a church service. You know what happened? He took him to the gate of the city. He said, you want to know where revival's about to go? It's about to get out of here. And it's about to go into the city and the Lord said by the time this move of God is over you won't just see it on college campuses and in church services God said he's about to open doors to the cities of America and cities that we never thought would be saved are about to be saved God's about to redeem 
I call out the city of Chicago. I call out New York City. I call out Los Angeles. I call out Orlando. I call out Ormond Beach, Port Orange, New Smyrna. God is about to redeem and save cities. Hey. The door didn't have to be kicked down, shook down, pushed down, strived down. He took Peter to Peter's gate for the city. Prophetic word. Receive it. God is about to walk you to some doors that will not open for anybody else but you in this move of God. God said, get ready. He's about to take you out of revival to the door. He said, this is how you're going to know it's your door. When you get in proximity, it's going to open for you without anybody's help, without anybody else's opinion. God is about to open some doors for you so that revival can go to the city. If you receive that, come on, if you receive it, lift up your hands. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for new open doors in 2023 that revival will not stay. Okay, last one. Peter gets revival. Give me revival. Peter goes through the gate into the city. Give us awakening. Give me revival. Give us awakening. <laughs> Threshold is the only thing that God's going to say. Give me revival. And before you know it, give us awakening. That's how fast. Y'all ain't see it. see it. That's how fast. Okay. Then the Bible says, Peter is now in revival. He's in awakening. And he says, now I know for certain that you have delivered me. And I asked the Lord how to close this altar moment. There is such a glory here, y'all. I said, God, how do you want me to close it? He said, tell my people in this move of God that they are not going to have to limp into the next season. He said, tell men and women of God, they are not going to have to struggle their way into the next thing I have prepared for my people. So God, I said, God, what do you want to do? He said, tell them this morning that I am going to deliver them. So I'm going to do something real radical. I want you to open those back doors back there. Open them, ushers. Open them. If I got an usher over here, somebody open a door. If I got somebody over there, open me a door. Lift up your hands. I'm going to finish this, and then I'm going to have Pastor Dawn pray us out. Because we're going to come back tonight at 6, but we're going to come into the dimension of it's too good to be true. <laughs> I wrestled last night. I had, I had spirits in my ear telling me, don't preach that. I had spirits in my ear telling me, God ain't going to do that. Don't, don't, don't do it like that. But I realized even the devil is afraid of what God is about to do. So I had them, lift up your hands. So I had them open up the doors. I don't know what area you need God to deliver you in. In your mind, in your heart, in your body. But spirits that are not the Holy Spirit are about to exit this sanctuary. They're about to exit your life. You're watching me online. They're about to exit your house. And they are never going to return again. So I'm going to give you 10 seconds. Whatever it is you need God to deliver. Come on, open up your mouth. Oh, I feel it right there. We are not limping into this thing. You're not limping in. You're not limping in, Christian. You're not limping in. God's plan for you in this thing is big. He wants to use you. And I bind any spirit that would tell you to hold back and to not let yourself loose. 
I bind any attack of the enemy in your mind that would tell you it's not real. In the name of Jesus, I pray over your life. Are you ready? Come on, pray in the Holy Ghost. Hey, 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 hey. Come on, don't stop, don't stop, don't stop, don't stop. Revival. I feel revival, I feel revival, I feel revival. I feel, I feel those demonic spirits getting nervous. Devil, I'm about to pray. God's people are about to pray. Come on, pray in the Holy Ghost. Come on, as you're praying, those spirits are backing up. They're backing up. They're backing up. I feel the fire of God burning out. Demonic spirits from rejection. Demonic spirits from disappointment. Every time from abuse. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Thank you, Holy Ghost. From times you were abused. From what people did to you in the name of Jesus. They're backing up now. I rebuke the spirit of anxiety and of depression. I rebuke the spirit, oh, hallelujah, of suicide. I rebuke the spirit that is holding you back from what God has prepared. You ready, Pastor Don? Let's pray deliverance in this room. Come on, lift up your hands. Come on, Pastor Don. Oh, I feel the Lord. I feel the Lord. Come on, don't stop. Don't stop. I come against the spirit of trauma. Trauma has come against the body of Christ since 2020. And in the name of Jesus, I command trauma to go from your life at the root. I say, come out. In the name of Jesus, go. Forgiveness is a big thing to be set free from the spirit of trauma. However that came in your life, if, if there's someone that you need to forgive right now, God wants to set you free, but you've got to first forgive. Right now, say, Father God, I forgive. Say their name. I forgive them for everything. I release them into your hands. I let them go. I give them to you. I even pray for them. Take a moment and pray for them. Father, you said to pray for those who hurt me, so I'll pray for them. I pray that you would bless them. I pray that you would draw them to you. I give them to you. And so now, say, Heavenly Father, I renounce trauma. I renounce the agreement that I have made with this trauma. I renounce every symptom, bondage, attachment that I have made with it. I renounce every vow, every pact, every agreement I have made with it. I renounce it today. I break its hold on my life. And I say, trauma, go from me. Go from me. Go from my life. I am set free by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of my testimony. Now raise up your hands and be filled with the Spirit of the Lord. 
Holy Spirit, now fill every place. Every place of trauma, abuse, rejection, abandonment. Every place that has just been loosed. Holy Spirit, I pray now that you would come in and feel. Feel. Somebody receives it. Holy Spirit, I receive you. I receive a fresh infilling. Fill every part of me. Fill every place of my heart. Fill every, every empty place. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, fill up today with your Holy Spirit. Fill us to overflowing, God. We don't want to just be filled to the full. But we say, Lord, fill us up until we overflow. Will you pray that? Say, Lord, fill me up until I overflow. Less of me and more of you. Less of me and more of you. Holy Spirit, have full reign in my life. Fill me up to overflow. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. If you have your prayer language, don't you begin to pray in the spirit. And if you're not filled with your prayer language, be filled with the Holy Spirit right now in the name of Jesus. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I feel like we've got to do this, Pastor Josh. There may be some people that have come down here and you have yet to receive Jesus Christ as the Lord of your life. For some reason, you came in this place today, but you've never made Jesus Lord. Is there anybody here? And you say, Pastor Dawn, I want to serve Jesus. I need a new beginning. I, I can't live this life on my own. I, I recognize that. I, I need Jesus. Is anybody in here and you say, I need Jesus this morning. I need Jesus to rescue me. I need Jesus to help me. I need Jesus to change me. With these that have their hands lifted, can we join with them this morning? Will you put your hand on your heart? And as we pray this prayer together, we are believing that right now there are people about to step out of darkness and into light. <laughs> Say, Heavenly Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. I am a sinner and I repent of every sin, everyone that I know and even those I don't know. I repent of them all and I lay it down at the cross of Jesus Christ. I believe in Jesus. I ask you, Lord, to come into my heart. I make room for you. Forgive me, cleanse me, and be the Lord of my heart today. In Jesus' name, I declare I am born again. I am a new creature in Christ. All things are passed away. And now I am made new in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Somebody give God praise right now. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Thanks for watching the message. I'm sure this spoke to you. Here's what I want you to do. Why don't you subscribe to this YouTube channel? That way, every time there's a new message, you'll get to hear it. Also, many of you have watched this. Some of you watch on a regular basis. Why not take time and so You can give at calvaryfl.com. You can give on your phones, and you can be a part of helping us take this message around the world, the message of hope the message of Jesus Christ. Can't wait to see you back here real soon.